Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Claudia Wilson Randall. I'm the Associate Director of the Baltimore of the Community Development Network. We're here today uh, as part of Baltimore Data Week at the Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance. Um, I am very excited for this panel today and excited to be part of one of the early uh, multi-state panels. We have we are delighted to have a great group of people today to talk about this issue of uh, housing insecurity and in particular racial disparities in housing insecurity. Um, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time giving everybody's introduction. Um, I'm, we're going to post the bios to the chat box so that people have a chance to read it, but I'm just to give a soft introduction of all the panelists and the order that we're going to go in today. Uh, we're going to start with Timothy Thomas. Uh, who is uh, from UC Berkeley and the author of the Baltimore eviction map. Um, he is going to present a great tool about uh, with eviction data from Baltimore. Um, I am really excited that he's on the panel today. It was great to see the tool. I think it will be quite a powerful tool for Baltimore to, to use and to see exactly what areas of uh, high eviction and low eviction and um, what's taking place in those in and particularly in the neighborhoods with high eviction. There were some surprises. Um, I after uh, uh, Timothy Thomas is finished, Alan Malik uh, from the Center for Community Progress uh, will present information uh, from his latest paper that he did with the uh, ABLE Foundation uh, that's drilling down on Baltimore neighborhood data. Um, that's an ex excellent paper. Um, it has a lot of very valuable data, which I hope that people working in community development will be able to use, um, as well as neighborhood associations to see exactly what's taking place uh, in your neighborhood. Um, then third on the panel is Sally Scott, and Sally just finished a paper also put out by the ABLE Foundation. Um, and that is a really great opportunity for us to see the changes in home ownership in Baltimore City and to see exactly what's taking place um, and where we're losing ground in uh, terms of home ownership. Finally, on today, we'll have Althea Saunders Rainier from Bond Secure Community Works. Um, and um, Althea can tell you a little bit about what these racial disparities and neighborhood disparities look like on the ground. Uh, she's been working with folks in Southwest Baltimore for a while now, and she can also tell you a bit about the work that she's done with Prosperity Now. Uh, so with that, I'm going to plunge right in and we can begin with uh, Timothy Thomas. Um, and I just wanna remind folks, um, if you have questions, uh, if there's something that you're interested in, please type in the chat. Um, and we have about, uh, an hour and a half, a little less after my in introduction. And so we should have plenty of time to answer some questions and address any issues. Um, and I just thank you to the Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators staff. Um, and I am really excited about this panel today and just the work that we're doing and we can do uh, to give data power and move forward on some of these issues. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Claudia, so much. Um, for that introduction and I'm just very excited to be here. So my name is Tim Thomas. I'm uh, the research director for the Urban Displacement Project uh, and I am going to start sharing my screen here uh, about a project that I'm the principal investigator of called the Eviction Study. Our website is pretty simple. Hopefully you can see it up there. It's just evictions.study. And uh, this is work that uh, is in conjunction with what I do at Berkeley. So I'm sure that some of you have heard about the Urban Displacement Project, We're very uh, more well known about making gentrification maps. And since I've come on board as research director, we are moving towards evictions work. And this largely, uh, this work is based off of research that I did in my dissertation and also while I was uh, at the East Science Institute for the University of Washington. Um, and largely what we did on this research is we used data science tools in combination with sociological theory to try and understand demographic disparities in evictions as well as neighborhood drivers of evictions. So just real quickly, what this site offers is uh, at the bottom, 
is some of our first work that we did in Washington State where we created some interactive maps. We also highlighted a massive racial disparity in Washington State. It's a very uh, white state, about 60 to 70 percent of the population is white, but for any neighborhood that has a black population in it, uh, which is about 9 percent of the population of the state, uh, black women are evicted seven times more than white women, and uh, black households in general are evicted even four or five times more than white households. And despite the fact of what we think about the uh, political sphere of Washington and Seattle and what's going on there, there's still a very large racial gap in terms of who is getting evicted. So uh, this work led to some legislation that helped change the pay or vacate period from three days to 14 days, which we thought was um, you know, kind of trying to bring academic research to the forefront and on the ground to help change policy. During this time, I met with uh, some attorneys who told me about what was going on in Baltimore City. Uh, in particular, Baltimore has about 150,000 eviction filings per year. Now, in Washington State, in King County, the most populated county, which is where Seattle is located, there are only 5,000 eviction filings. Now, eviction filings are different, and I just want to take a second to explain this. You know, you get a notice if you are most likely behind on rent sometimes for breaking rules. And if you don't pay or vacate during the given period of time, it goes towards an eviction filing, which is basically this is when it gets on your record. Now at that point, when it gets on your record, this helps uh, prevent people from being able to obtain better housing in the future. And it also impacts uh, how people are able to, uh, you know, uh, uh, the opportunities that they have and also having to pay fees and all that. And then finally, if the unlawful detainer or the filing goes through, it leads to uh, physical removal by the sheriff. That's called the writ of restitution. Now, the data that we had in Washington state was eviction filings. And the data that we had in Baltimore is uh, the writ of restitutions, the actual scheduled physical removals by the sheriff. So what we did is we did an analysis and we estimated the race of the individuals named on here. And on this link, we have a small report. Now I wanna highlight one of these graphs down here. I was double checking it and something's kind of off at the very bottom. I'll fix that after my talk because it's kind of embarrassing to have a graph that's wrong. But largely what we found is that evictions in Baltimore uh, are very, uh, there's still a, a very high rate of evictions amongst those that are uh, black or African American. And in fact, we analyzed a close to 9,349 scheduled evictions from 2018 to 2019. This is what's called the fiscal year, so from July 2018 to July 2019. And we saw that about 60% of these cases led to an actual removal. So in other words, just because you had a scheduled eviction, you may be able to call it off or you know, pay your rent and the landlord basically uh, halts the eviction when the sheriff shows up. And uh, what's interesting about that is that it seems like evictions in Baltimore City in particular, and I'm sure other cities are like this too, but in Baltimore, evictions are kind of used as a tool to try and enforce rent payment from individuals. This is kind of a very uh, a paternalistic tool and there's been some research talking about evictions being used as a paternalistic measure uh, to try and enforce rent payments. But what's problematic about that is that it ignores a lot of the legacies of inequality that have happened over the decades, especially in a city. I'm sure we're going to hear a lot about that and what's going on about these legacies. And what our research finds is that these legacies persist through evictions. We see that 40%, 46% more female-headed households, overall black, white, all different groups, were removed from their homes as compared to male-headed households. So that's a ratio of about three women to every two male-headed households. And when I say male-headed household, that means we're estimating that you know it's a uh, male-headed household. They're probably the breadwinner. It's, it's unclear, but uh, we try to see who is the, the female versus male-headed household. If it's a female-headed household, there's a high probability there are children in the household too. We don't have those counts, but that is just basically some of the assumptions we're coming in with. 
The number of black eviction removals is three times higher or 195% more than white evictions. So we counted about four, over 4,800 black evictions versus 1,600 white evictions in Baltimore City. The number of black female headed household removals is about 3.9 times higher, which is close to 300% more than the number of white male headed evictions. So it's about 3,000 uh, black female headed evictions over 775 white male headed evictions. And it's about 2.3 times higher uh, for black male headed households over, black, over white male headed households. Again, this information is on our website, so you can review at evictions.study. And finally, 7.3% of all black male-headed households and 5.4% of all black female-headed households were removed from their homes. That's a ra uh, these rates are roughly 51% and 11% higher than the white male-headed eviction rate. So in other words, 7.3% of the whole black population, of black male-headed population was actually physically removed, while 5.4% of all black female-headed uh, households were removed. So with this information, we decided to use some of these data science tools to try and convey this a little more. And we provided a map. We have a link down here at the bottom, and we also have uh, a link at the very top too. You can click on here, or you can click on this orange button to see the map. This is kind of where the bread and butter is. Um, largely what we did is we did several things. First of all, when you first land on the map, this tool shows a considerably higher rate of evictions as compared to the rest of the city of Baltimore versus a lower rate of evictions as compared to the city of Baltimore. So for example, anything that's in orange is a really high rate. And in fact, you can click on each tract. But we provide some information. Now we had a sample of evictions. And so the reason why we went with this route is it's actually a uh, a tool used by epidemiologists. When you have incomplete data, you can still make some assumptions about what is considered a high risk eviction area versus a low risk eviction area. And so in the tool, you can see the track name, how many households are there according to the census, and how many sampled evictions scheduled and removals we have. Um, and we can also show that the risk of scheduled eviction is about 2.3 times higher than the city average in this particular tract. If we go over here to extremely high location, we see that this area has uh, fewer renters, but it definitely has uh, a, a much higher, four times the city average over here. And then uh, another area that's super high. Again, not as many renting households, but still a very extremely high rate of uh, evictions as compared to the rest of the city. Now, we also just real quickly provide some information about the segregation within the city of Baltimore too as a layer. So as you can see, the butterflies uh, showing very well, basically a, a large proportion of black population, mostly African-American households in these areas. Again, we, we have slide down here and we provide some demographic information. This neighborhood in particular in the census in 2018 was 100% black. Um, and this area is uh, highly concentrated, a lot of poverty in these areas as well as over here on the east side. But this is also the side where the uh, Johns Hopkins Medical Center is coming in and some arguably uh, high levels of gentrification are happening. The green areas highlight where mostly white households are located at. And up in here is where Johns Hopkins located. White Asian households are located over here, three different groups. Again, if you click inside here, you can see which groups that this neighborhood composes mostly of. Um, and so it highlights this racial disparity that we kind of talk about based on the location. We also highlight where a lot of the historic red line zoned areas are located at. And so what's interesting is that again in Baltimore, the butterfly shows a lot of the hazardous and definitely declining uh, areas of, uh, of segregation that happened from the Hulk maps that were produced back in 1930s. Uh, so the Hulk maps, for those that don't know, basically they redlined or lined out these areas that are quote unquote uh, desirable areas to invest in or declining areas or hazardous areas. And so basically if you were in a, a, a grade A or grade B neighborhood, you could get a loan pretty easily. In fact, you could get a loan that was probably cheaper than your rent. But the problem is what they found is that most of these quote unquote def uh, definitely declining and hazardous neighborhoods 
were centered around African-American segregated neighborhoods. And to this day, as you can see, all these orange and red spots are pretty close to what the uh, investment uh, legacies are in Baltimore City, too. It's just, you, you can't, you know, you don't need a PhD to really see this relationship here. So when we look at uh, these different tools, we highlight where evictions are happening. And what we see a lot is that, you know, and generally, uh, and I'll wrap up with this, is some observations that we made about Baltimore City. Evictions happen most in poor neighborhoods, right? But race is one of the biggest predictors. In my dissertation, I found that the uh, more diverse or even the more uh, black households that are located in the neighborhood, the higher the risk or the higher the relationship of evictions happening. This seems to be very similar in Baltimore City too. And something else that's interesting is that, you know, in the West Side, we have um, some very large segregated black neighborhoods. We see evictions kind of churning. In other words, they're just kind of happening over and over again. And then on the uh, East Side, we have uh, some areas of gentrification. So what we kind of see is that basically there's a spike in gentrifying areas, a spike in evictions, and then several years later it dissipates and it turns into a very low gentrifying area. So if you think about the history of, of how Baltimore City has been uh, operating, how these neighborhoods work, you can kind of see some of these spikes and declines in evictions. Um, and so with that, Tim, I just kind of... Tim, I, I, we're gonna wrap up here, but um, somebody's asking just about your the data that the question is about whether the, what's the numerator and the denominator are. The numerator, I think, is the sheriff ex evictions over the writs of re restitution, is that correct? It's over the renting households by race. So we, we estimate the, based on the name of the individual, so their last name has a probability of being of a certain race or ethnicity, and then where they live informs that, so it's a Bayesian model. So basically, so you know, take the name Jackson, has a high probability of being African American, but you put that Jackson in a white neighborhood, it makes, it drops that probability and, and, and uh, makes them white. But if they're in a black neighborhood, it just reinforces that probability that they're African American. So with that estimation, we put the race of the uh, scheduled eviction in the numerator and the census household racial composition in the denominator. Okay. Great. That's, um, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll end that, so. Okay, yeah. no, but thank you, that's helpful. And I, we're, we're just gonna move right along to Alan. Um, and I really appreciate uh, folks asking questions and we can address them in real time where possible. But I, I look forward, I know there'll be more questions. Your, your eviction study mapping is, is fantastic. It looks like a great tool that will be really useful. Okay, Malin, Alan, you're, you're muted. Still muted. Now I'm, now I'm not. Now you're not. Now that not. sounds okay, great. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Claudia. And I'm going to talk about some issues having to do with demographic and housing market neighborhood change in Baltimore. And before I get into it, I'd like just show, mention briefly, since this is about data in a sense, <clears throat> that I'm largely using three data sets in this analysis, but they're very rich data sets. The first one is, obviously, is a 2000 census, which was the last time they used the long form. And that gives you all the social and economic and demographic data. I compare that to, in this case, it's a 2017 American Community Survey, which gives you the basic data, but to be perfectly honest, it has a significant margin of error. So when you look at any individual neighborhood, there are a lot of questions about the data, but when you look at broad trends, it's likely to be pretty reliable. And then finally, what we did was bought a big chunk of housing market data from a commercial provider so we had data on sales prices, sales volumes, percentage of absentee buyers, foreclosures, and I think there might have been something else, as well as the distribution of prices by price range. So we were able really to drill down both in terms of what's happening in terms of housing and what's happening in terms of demographics. Now, the 
first thing we got to know is Baltimore is changing very rapidly, and the change is very powerfully linked to race. So, for example, in the last 10 years, the white population of Baltimore has largely stabilized. The black population is still going down at a significant rate. But that's only part of it, because when we look at who is coming in and leaving by race, it's diametrically opposite. Among the white population, low and middle income households are still con continuing to leave Baltimore. You know, working class and middle class households and families are still leaving. But they're more than offset by a massive influx of young college educated millennials who've been populating the area around the harbor, the area to the north and west of Johns Hopkins University and so forth. Among black residents, it's exactly the opposite. The higher the income, the more likely they are to be moving out. So this, this means that the city is polarizing economically along racial lines even more than historically. And what we found when we looked at individual neighborhoods is that neighborhoods, middle income neighborhoods are disappearing and both low income and upper income neighborhoods are increasing at a significant pace. So essentially the middle is tending to disappear. And the neighborhoods are very strongly stratified by race. So if you look at the, the economic distribution by, in this case, white means less than 30% black, mixed is 30 to 70%, black is 70% or more African-American. And, but you can see that again, reflecting this polarization and this disparate migration pattern, the Black neighborhoods are predominantly low and moderate income, mixed are mixed, and the white neighborhoods tend to be middle and upper income. So what we're getting, instead of a typical population distribution across the board, we're seeing a black population that is increasingly concentrated in lower income categories and a white population that is increasingly concentrated in upper. And when you look at the change in neighborhood character, economic character over time, what we find is that there is a powerful tendency for black neighborhoods to decline economically, for predominantly white neighborhoods to rise economically, and for racially mixed neighborhoods to stay largely the same. So again, you know, if if one wanted to predict the neighborhood trajectory of a particular neighborhood in Baltimore, and I say this with all humility, if you know the racial composition of that neighborhood, you can predict its trajectory with a depressing degree of accuracy. That's not true in every neighborhood, but it is true for the most part. Now, one of the key factors here is that is the out-migration of black families. And since 2000, Baltimore has lost 30,000 black residents. But actually that understates what's going on because during that same period, Baltimore's black population grew through natural increase, the excess of births over deaths by 20,000. So the actual out-migration was, was roughly 50,000 people. And the, within Baltimore, at many areas, especially, especially the lower and middle income neighborhoods on the west side, and to some extent on the east side, lost black population. The one part of the city as a whole that gained black population, and significantly, it gained 15,000 black residents over this period is what I call, I call it the Northeast Triangle. And it's the area that you can see on the map shown with the dotted lines. And that is the area where a sig significant numbers of middle-class African-American families are moving 
from the east side as well as the west side. But the, the net outward migration is in round numbers 50,000 people. And what this reflects is what is one of, I'm going to talk about three sort of neighborhood challenges. But the first and perhaps the most significant one is the neighborhoods that are sort of lack moderate income neighborhoods. And in this case, moderate income, we're talking about neighborhoods where the median income is typically between 30 and $45,000 a year, median household income. So this is, these are not the poorest neighborhoods. They tend to be working class neighborhoods with, that are struggling, but are still at some level of functionality. Well, if you look at the numbers, and I won't go into this in gory detail, they are, these neighborhoods as a class are moving seriously down, downward. As you can see from the map, only two out of about 50 or 60 of these census tracts moved upward to become middle income neighborhoods, while over half of them moved downward. Of the ones that stayed in that moderate income range, all but three, which are shown with the little red stars, moved downward. So very few of these neighborhoods are stable. As you can see, they're hemorrhaging population, homeowners. They, their houses have lost significant value, which means the owners have lost significant wealth. Large percentage of the buyers today are investors rather than home buyers and vacancies are on the rise. And again, these are not the poorest neighborhoods in the city. They're the ones that are a notch higher. So this is a huge crisis because this represents a significant part of the neighborhoods that African-American people in Baltimore live in. The second, and one of the key issues is, you know, when you look at the relationship between the number of home owners in a neighborhood and the number of home buyers based on some pretty straightforward rules of thumb. You can tell pretty quickly whether there are enough buyers to maintain a given level of home ownership. And what's interesting in most Baltimore neighborhoods, most there are currently, this is 2017 data, but but within the you know, low income and moderate income, predominantly African-American neighborhoods, there are not enough buyers, period, to replace the normal turnover of homeowners who move, who pass away, and so forth. So the upshot is that I, when a house becomes empty, well, 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 when somebody moves in any of these neighborhoods, in most cases, if an investor doesn't buy it, it's abandoned. And so these are the areas where at the same time as the city is trying to get houses rehabbed through vacants to value and other means, these are the areas that keep offsetting whatever progress is made in other parts of the city. I call this, by the way, this range between four and 8% here. The, I call it the Goldilocks range. It's a, a real estate market that's not too hot, so you don't have a lot of speculation and price pressure, but it's not too cold that there's enough buyers to replace existing homeowners. Okay. The second area is the Northeast Triangle. And here I think there's a real issue, which I don't know how we deal with, how anybody deals with it, because I think it's extremely problematic, but I think it has to be put on the table and thought about. One of the things that's striking, and so I looked at here, I compared the percentage of black home buyers, the, no, the percentage of black, po yeah, black population in those census tracts that are colored in on the map with the percentage of home buyer mortgages which went to black home buyers. And as you can see, it's about as perfect a correlation as you're likely to find in the real world. I forget the numbers, but it's something like 0.89 or, or so. Now, the problem is 
that what that means is that as a neighborhood, as the, as the black percentage of a population in a neighborhood increases, the number of white buyers decreases and the pool of prospective buyers for that neighborhood becomes smaller and smaller. Because, and one thing, and I just read an amazing paper by a psychologist in California and a couple of her colleagues that who look, who did a series of visualizations of neighborhoods with white subjects. And what she found is that if you took a neighborhood that was clearly middle class, but had black, but, but the people on the streets had black faces, the white subjects didn't classify it as middle class, but if there were white faces, they did. So this is a classic racial blindness. And this is the mechanism that is starting to work in the northeastern part of the city. And again, I don't know how you combat that, but I think it's a critical issue if we're going to preserve the viability of what is the largest collection of solid middle-class neighborhoods in the city of Baltimore. Finally, gentrification is basically concentrated in the area that sort of rings around the harbor, downtown, and an arc sort of moving out of Johns Hopkins. <clears throat> and in all likelihood, within 10 years or so forth, you'll see the two areas that are in the red circle combine along the Charles Street corridor. Now, and as you can see, the transformation in these tracts compared to the rest of the city has absolutely been mind boggling. Two thirds of all the adults in these tracts have a college degree, a, a four year college degree or higher. Over one third are in that 25 to 34 millennial age group. And this is totally off the charts compared to the rest of the city. So these are areas that are, I would say by any reasonable definition, gentrifying. And, but what we found when we looked at what the characteristics of these neighborhoods were, two key points. The first one, I looked at what I called gentrifiable tracts in 2000, which means that they have, I'm almost done, they have, you know, an income below, in this case, 150% of the city median. Of 40 white tracts that met that definition, 18 had gentrified 17 years later. Of 110 predominantly black tracts that met the same definition, only four had gentrified. And so what's happening basically is that gentrification in Baltimore is most heavily impacting lower and middle income white neighborhoods. And the second table on this slide really shows that. If we look at change in households, which is essentially, you know, you could call this displacement, you could call it replacement, whatever. In terms of African-American households, yes, there was a decline in the gentrifying neighborhoods, but the decline was basically around 10% or about 700 households. But when we looked at low-income white households, we found that the number of low-income white households dropped by 3,800 or over 50 percent over the same period. So basically the key point is that the people being displaced or replaced by gentrification in Baltimore so far are predominantly low-income white households. Now this could definitely change over the coming decade as gentrification, assuming gentrification continues to move outward through into other parts of the city. But up to this point, that's the dominant pattern. So just to wrap up, I'd like to focus, there are the four key challenges. Baltimore is losing its working and middle-class families. Baltimore's moderate income neighborhoods are in a state of crisis. The Baltimore's, the Northeast Triangle, Baltimore's principal res reservoir of solid middle-class neighborhoods is 
doing okay, but has a risk factor built into it. And finally, what we need to do is focus on how to make sure that if neighborhoods do gentrify, they preserve both racial and economic diversity going forward. So I think that's the key, those are some key issues to think about, and I thank you very much. Sorry, um, while we're, we're changing to Sally's presentation, I just wanna ask a quick question, which is how does Baltimore, is what's happening in Baltimore profoundly different than what's happening in other cities of similar size and scope? It is not profoundly different. I would say actually compared to, I've, I'm just finishing a paper that's about ready to go in <clears throat> to a journal, of looking at Baltimore as one of six cities. And actually Baltimore's middle income black neighborhoods are actually, I would say doing better than average compared to a number of other cities. So Baltimore is not an outlier in the sense of saying this is a uniquely Baltimorean phenomenon. It's part of a broad trend that's going on affecting African-American working class and middle class neighborhoods in older cities like Baltimore, Philadelphia, Cleveland, Chicago, and so forth all over the United States. Yes, and I guess my, my, uh, the, the connection I also want to make is to a larger system of, um, you know, racism and white supremacy that we're, we're, you know, we're wrestling with at this moment in history. And just that, that it's, a, it's part of a system and it's not, you know, I think that every city feels like it's different. Um, I think as you go around, you see similar patterns and you see similar um, a uh, legacies of, um, a amen amen and i think again i i think what i and i'll say i'll send the article i mentioned around because i think it is i mean it's pretty dense in terms of you know academic jargon and all that sort of thing but it's incredibly powerful because i think this notion of black middle class neighborhood invisibility to white people is you know one of the yes. key mechanisms by which the racialism manifests itself and i think that's you know how again i don't know how you fix it but i think we've got to identify it first okay um sally are you ready to go yes i am great um can, okay can you see my screen yes we can see your screen so um i'm just jump right in there sally um i will do so well i'm really happy to be here and i think a lot of the um points that Alan made in his presentation um, are very useful for understanding what we observed as well. So I wrote this paper uh, with Seema Iyer um, of Benia, Jacob France Institute, and um, really thank her and her team for helping with the data piece on this. Okay, so the report was written back in 2019 before the COVID pandemic hit, um, and we have tweaked it a bit to reflect the pandemic, but you know, what we found was prior to the pandemic, clear evidence that we need to address racial income, wealth, and home ownership gaps. Uh, I think as Alan and Claudia were mentioning, these are national issues as well as issues in Baltimore. And I think it's particularly urgent now where we have black families facing greater risk of contracting COVID while suffering also greater housing insecurity, both from eviction and from uh, the potential in the future of foreclosure. The initial question that led to this report was uh, posed to us by the Abel Foundation. And there had been a study written by Ben Hecht of the Living Cities Foundation saying, um, he was asking would expanding flexibly underwritten home loans and offering more extensive first time home buyer incentives create more home buyers nationally and Abel wanted to know, would that be true in Baltimore? That was an intriguing question that we wanted to pursue. So the time frame we explored was starting in 2010 to capture the impact of the Great Recession and uh, through to 2017, because as we were writing the report, um, that was the last year full data sets uh, were available to us. 
And the data we used um, included uh, home ownership and mortgage statistics, uh, American Community Survey, which Alan mentioned, Maryland Property View, and the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, or HMDA. We added to that uh, qualitative data, um, reviewing national and local documents on home ownership, uh, especially analyses of structural racism and uh, the decline in black home ownership taking place across the country. We did interviews with leaders of nonprofit organizations, especially groups that offer housing counseling or uh, produce affordable home ownership um, housing. And we also talked to lenders and realtors working in the city. And of course, I wanna give a great deal of thanks for those, to those people who gave of their time and expertise, including people I've worked with at CDN in the Advocacy and Policy Committee for Baltimore. They've been um, a great source of knowledge for me. So this is the, the map that probably best captures um, some of the data that we found. Um, and I wanna add a little data um, quantitative data um, background to this as you're looking at it. What you can see here is that the high, highest level changes in owner occupancy are in the deeper red. Um, next level, which is also quite high in the dark orangey brown color, and then um, less high, but still a decline more with more within the um, average is the tan. And finally, there were some areas where home ownership actually grew and those are outlined in green. So as you're looking at this, the, the overall Baltimore home ownership rate fell from 51% to 47%, while the black home ownership rate fell from 45 to 42%. And that's in line with the national numbers where um, black home ownership rate is around 43%. So this is a local and a national crisis. And we know um, there's a lot of uh, great work being done to figure out why this is happening, but we know it's rooted in decades of segregation, redlining, blockbusting, legal and illegal discrimination, um, but still progress was being made. And then the great recession hit, um, which stripped billions of dollars nationally from black as well as Hispanic communities. So here in Baltimore, um, we see that this Southwestern edge is particularly hard hit in terms of loss of home ownership. Uh, those reflect both majority white and majority black neighborhoods. Areas with the highest rates of loss are, are generally not in the city core. They're more around the edges with this exception um, going up Greenmount Avenue. And as Alan, I think, made a, a very compelling case for, there is a tremendous loss of black home ownership, uh, loss of black middle class. And that's a huge problem for our city. There were a few increases in home ownership. Those mostly occurred where black populations were falling or not growing. There were a few examples of home ownership growing with majority black homeowners. And those are in areas where there have been long-term revitalization initiatives, and I think deserve a closer look. Um, this is another map capturing um, a lot of the same data, but kind of looking, drawing the distinction between where before home ownership um, fell, where was their um, above average owner occupancy, where was their below average owner occupancy. So what you see in the tan and the red are declines of more than 6% in home ownership or owner occupancy, um, distinguished by the tan, which is where there had been above, above average, and the red where there had been below average. So we're seeing a lot of those neighborhoods um, around the edges of the city where there had been above average and then a decline of greater than 6%. Um, in more in the middle of the city and then up in the north and northwest, we see that the decline in homeownership was less than 6%, um, the blue being where there had been above average owner occupancy and the green below average. 
So what is happening in Baltimore to promote home ownership? Because if you remember back, the question we were asked is if you provide more flexible loan products, more incentives, could we really shift some of these numbers around? And there is a lot going on. There's an extensive array of services and incentives. That includes home buyer education and home ownership counseling, usually offered by nonprofit organizations. There's an excellent website uh, at Live Baltimore where you can go to find out all the incentives that are available in one place. Um, they work cl very closely with Baltimore City Home Ownership Office. And then there's funding um, and mortgage products provided by the state of Maryland funding from the federal government, live near your work from local employers and support, especially for the nonprofit efforts by foundations. So that's one set of incentives. We've also got um, nonprofit affordable housing developers who are either doing complete rehabs of existing homes, constructing new affordable homes, and they reach out to potentially qualified buyers and they provide education and counseling for renters who want to become homeowners. And they do um, tremendous work. As one uh, affordable housing developer said to me, it's like creating a souffle. There's so many different aspects to the process. What do we see though with the results of the existing system? Is it um, making a difference? And I think you probably have guessed from the previous slides that it's not making at least enough of a difference. That's not to say there isn't some success and I think we shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater. There are there is success in helping home buyers, especially people who can navigate the complex system, who are financially close to ready, if not ready. Um, there's success in getting those folks um, to buy in, in Baltimore. And DHCD's Office of Home Ownership at the city, working closely with Live Baltimore, successfully provided 3.3 million in incentives in fiscal year 2019. However, what I heard again and again, and I experienced my, myself just going on and looking um, at the websites, is that there is a tremendous amount of complexity in the system without scale, without large numbers of people being affected. There are multiple loan products, multiple down payment options, tax credits, renovation programs, but they're not achieving the scale uh, that we would like. Similarly, the affordable housing developers doing really difficult and important work are providing sustainable home ownership to around 100 people a year, some years less, some years more. And this is of great value for those who move into those homes, but it's not on the scale to impact the city's home ownership rates. So we've got two pools of aspiring homeowners in Baltimore. There's a smaller pool, and we don't have exact numbers for this, but this is what um, we, we gleaned from our interviews as well as what we were able to, to get from the data. Smaller pool of folks who are mostly ready to buy. And if they go through a home ownership class, get some counseling, get some incentives, they can make that transition from rental to home ownership. There's a much larger pool of people who are aspiring, who um, hear about home ownership opportunities, but they're not yet ready. And the most uh, remarkable example I heard of this is of a, from an affordable housing developer who said of the hundred people who contact them thinking about buying a home, getting into their program, one person out of a hundred makes it all the way through and is able to buy a home. These folks are plagued um, by lack of income. We know that um, economic inequality is rampant in our um, nationally and uh, also locally. They um, often have poor credit and high debt, and those problems were exacerbated by the Great Recession, where a lot of people were just, you know, clinging to, to, to life rafts to stay afloat and often, um, you know, got, got, into, got into bad mortgages, went through foreclosure, and ended up with a lot of debt and poor credit. Um, so, to go back to the original question, more incentives, flexible loan products, that's not going to do the trick. We are dealing you know, with a situation here, and Claudia alluded to it, of decades of structural racism, mm -hmm. um, which of course took, took place um, in many different ways, um, compounded by the Great Recession. And that's 
created this deep-rooted income, wealth, and home ownership gaps for Black Baltimoreans and Black Americans in general. Uh, so the, the question that we, uh, we end up asking, I think, is how do we change the map? And Alan's talked about focusing on the Northeast corner and stabilizing moderate income neighborhoods there. And uh, I certainly think that's, that's an approach that, that could be tried, but I think we need to go further. Um, and I think we need national support to do so. Um, any business as usual um, is not going to work. And which means we need new policies at the city, state and federal level. And um, I think since this COVID virus has hit, we're starting to see some of that more ambitious thinking because of the terrible health dimensions of not being securely housed. Uh, Sally, so, I'm gonna need you to wrap up, but I, I, I do also wanna say that um, I, I hope that in, we also get to talk about Althea's, some of the work that Althea is doing and some of the um, you know, targeted interventions that, that may be needed. Exactly, yeah. Well, let's, this is my last slide. Um, so in terms of rec recommendations, I think maintaining a focus on racial equity because of the racial disparities of the past and present is crucial. There still is a great need to reach out to current and potential residents, whether that's through a better, less complex system, <laughs> Um, providing education, counseling, loans, incentives. New models of financial coaching and outreach. Those are for the people who are not ready to buy, but can be so in the future if they're um, provided with the proper support for some period of time. And then really important not to forget current homeowners, especially the elderly, who are in existing affordable home ownership. If um, they, lose, they lose their property or if their descendants lose that property, it goes right into that pipeline towards vacancy. If we step back, we've got to think about the larger picture of changing frameworks and systems. And I would advocate for a um, citywide uh, affordable housing policy where we really take um, not an issue by issue, but a comprehensive look at both rental and home ownership and how we can get significantly more money into the system. And that involves connecting home ownership and community development. Um, so we need affordable homes, as Alan said, where there's gentrification occurring or where there's efforts simply to revitalize neighborhoods. We need to make sure that that affordability remains in place. And we need the federal government's help. This is really, really tough for Baltimore to do on its own. So I advise you to look at the National Low Income Housing Coalition um, and their proposals for um, a major national shift in our allocation of resources toward housing. And thank you, Claudia, for giving me that chance to wrap up. I'm muted again, sorry about that. Um, so I, I really appreciate the folks that have already typed questions in the chat um, for us to answer. Um, as I'm talking, we're gonna move to Althea saunders Renier from Bon Secours to talk about the work that she's been doing um, to really address uh, directly uh, people who are facing housing, uh, who are housing insecure, both rental and home, and preparing people for home ownership. Um, and she doesn't have a presentation, so hopefully um, we're, we're not uh, boring the folks out there. I'm really excited, actually, that there are 110 people on this, uh, watching this presentation now. That's great. And I know there is a lot of interest in this topic. Um, I'm also looking forward to us talking about action that we actually need to take. So um, with that, I'm going to turn things over to Althea, and we're going to um, have her be on screen uh, talking to you. Good afternoon, uh, and thank you, uh, Dr. Wilson Randall and Baltimore Neighborhood Indicator Alliance for inviting Bon Secours Community Works to join this conversation. The racial disparity in home ownership and eviction rates are staggering in communities of color. As many of us know, the racial wealth divide has increased and communities of color are being left behind with no opportunities for mobility. Having worked with families on evictions, we understood the challenge faced by families. To improve our program, we were able to work with Prosperity Now to redesign our program 
so that property managers are receptive to re-engaging tenants to get back on track as well as tenant buy-in. Uh, additionally, we were able to work with Prosperity Now on another project, um, and Sally, uh, there was some mention of this at, with on a project called Debt in Black Communities as the divide between communities of color expand and how could we be agents of change for our community. Uh, this new focus for us um, as we have worked with began March 1st, which was um, very interesting because it was also at the same time COVID would start to encroach into our lives. And um, this couldn't be more timely in terms of the topic and the timing. Because um, just as that was hitting, it brought to light the challenges that these communities face. No health insurance, no time off, no sick leave, and yet they are the most essential workers in our economy. These, initi these initiatives would help us to better serve our community and residents as we look toward uh, a pilot to address the um, delinquent payments that negatively impact families. This, um, this current pilot consists of us having um, funding that would be accessible for families who were now uh, going to face eviction. Again, this was prior to the uh, COVID um, um, that happened because the funding that we had wasn't really large enough. And then there became this outpouring of funding to, to, to nonprofits and organizations to help families as they move forward. Uh, evictions are now uh, are not new to Bon Secours. And while we received funding to do this over the 20 plus years, there are still many challenges but much of what our communities face are institutional and systemic. Our focus has been on prevention and intervention with residents at three of Bon Secours family properties in Southwest, in Southwest um, Baltimore. Um, so I wanna give you some of the statistics. Local statistics are representative of our apartment residents and the community in which uh, they live. There's longstanding disinvestment and socioeconomic and racial disparities in health and income. Zip code 21223, which surrounds our location, has 23,800 citizens and the worst socioeconomic and health indicators in Baltimore, Maryland. Nearly 40% of the citizens live below uh, the poverty line versus 22% for the city. Median income is twenty six thousand eight ninety nine, more than twenty thousand lower than Baltimore, and more than fifty five thousand less than the state of Maryland. And the one challenge that has always been with Maryland, when we look at this number, is where Baltimore is situated. It's situated in a in between Washington, D.C., and and uh, Virginia. Uh, which in this in this tri-state makes it very challenging when we are looking for money for residents of Baltimore City because it pushes up the income level here in Baltimore City, um, making it look higher than what it is because the incomes are so much higher um, because of where we are situated and the kinds of jobs and opportunities that many uh, are able to access because of being uh, near Washington. Um, uh, less than um, the, the area is plagued by unemployment, economic blight, and vacant buildings, and a few uh, after school and recreational opportunities, and poorly performing uh, schools, jobs are lacking, and transportation outside the area is spotty. That's kind, uh -huh. Althea. Uh, I, I wouldn't even say, I think, spotty or non, non-existent. Existent, yes. Yeah. And <laughs> since, since COVID, non-existent. There are high rates of incarceration and 30% of Maryland's returning citizens or formerly incarcerated come back to Southwest Baltimore. The deep poverty experienced by these residents has created conditions that undermine the health, economic, and educational success of families in the area. Violence and open-air drug markets uh, everyday occurrences, the fatal shooting rate of 21.8 per 10,000 is more than three times the rate of the city itself, and the homicide rate of 8.2 per 10,000 is lower than that of the city. 
Again, life expectancy in Southwest is 68 years, or more than five years less than Baltimore City and 15 years less than that in the prosperous northern area of the city. Uh, Long-term trauma is a significant factor for resident health. In a behavioral health assessment of 683 uh, Bon Community Work clients over a one-year period, 31% were found to be at risk for moderate to severe depression, 28% signs of significant anxiety, 14% reported a history of suicide ideation, and 28% reported symptoms of PTSD. So we see that there's uh, the health disparities. And let's, and let's be mindful that many of these families, um, unfortunately, uh, still lack uh, good uh, health care. Uh, corresponding numbers from the um, National Institute of Mental Health uh, for the general population are uh, 6.7, 22.8, and 4, uh, and 3.6%. Th and we see these effects every day at Bon Secours where 95% of patients who come to the hospital's emergency department have a primary or secondary diagnosis of mental health or substance disorder. And we can say that a lot of this comes from uh, uh, the, the systemic uh, and institutional issues that, that these families face. Um, it's unfortunately, sometimes the hopelessness that we see within our families. Fin financial instability and financial literacy are major issues in Baltimore City. 32% of African Americans have zero net worth. 59% are cost burden renters. Um, medium household income for African Americans is 33801 versus 62751 for whites. It will take 242 years for the average African American family to amass the same wealth the average white family owns today. Among African Americans, 20.1% are unbanked and 31.8% are underbanked. Um, this housing location includes Bon Secours Apartments, uh, Gibbon Apartments, and New Shiloh Apartments. Um, it's a total of 272 Bon Secours. It's 119 units and 58 scatter site buildings located throughout the Baltimore campus near Bon Secours Hospital and Bon Secours Community Works. Uh, Gibbons has 80 units located on the Gibbons Commons campus and New Shiloh has 73 apartments, and the design is part of a master plan community on the campus of the New Shiloh Baptist Church. Just a snapshot of our residents and properties by the numbers. 100% <clears throat> of the residents are low income. Of the units at Gibbons and New Shiloh, 30% of the units have rent subsidies. The rest do not. There are relatively no, no low number of vacant units, 11 per month, and a high number of delinquent accounts, 76 per month. Baseline rent payment delinquency rate is 27%. All heads of household are African American except for three residents at New Shiloh Apartments. Median age, 50. Median household size, 2. Female slash male head of household. Female is 152 total. Male is 35. And it does not include New Shiloh due to incomplete data at the time of this. As a result, more than 80% are female heads of household. Enterprise Community Partment, Partnership Partners is a nationally recognized nonprofit focused on creating affordable housing and building strong communities. Enterprise states it's common practice to detect and treat disease in medical settings, yet the origins of illness can be identified long before someone enters the doctor's office. An estimated 70% of differences in health statuses are associated with people's social and physical environment, including the quality, affordability, stability, and location of a person's home. The result is striking disparities that adversely affect low-income communities. So 
even as we were developing uh, this uh, new way in which we wanted to target the um, house, our affordable housing, what has come to be recognized is that um, because of COVID, we've, we've, of course, this has taken on a new um, meaning because the amount of money that we were able to set aside to assist families with who were facing evictions because the program is set up such that we would identify families before they became more than 30 days behind. Um, group workshops will would be conducted. The curriculum would be based on the successful workshop we have facilitated for many years that was developed out of a client need and participant feedback. So anyone who is receiving assistance through our program has to go to a workshop. It was initially when we started, um, we used to just kind of give a check and then send them on their way. But we recognized that um, as we uh, looked at our overall program and having now been doing financial coaching for some number of years, we knew we had to offer our residents more than just simply a check. And so part of the criteria is that they come in and we do pre and post tests. They do a test on what's called credit myths, credit literacy, a spending plan, essentials, um, and we look and see what they did coming in and what happens during the course of that workshop when they take a post test and we begin to be able to see the increased knowledge. What we find is that if we uh, offer financial education, there's a different outcome and a different behavior from the residents. Residents are more inclined to begin to understand where they are and what needs to happen. Financial coaching is our platform. The ability to use financial coaching is to build a relationship um, with the resident. And that has been very helpful because residents will come back based on the relationship. Additionally, residents must have a one-on-one -on -one coaching session. We do uh, the group coaching um, wherein these tests um, happen, and then they come for one-on-one. -on -one. It is amazing to see the amount of learning that takes place, that when you do the one-on-one, -on -one, what you do not have to do now is go back and educate them on the areas of credit and budgeting, and they can then have a different, we pull credit reports, they then have a different behavior and outlook in terms of what is happening in terms of their financial situation. So not only are we engaging them through the financial coaching platform to say that they will be a part of whatever their plan is that they lay out, but also we empower them because now they understand some parts of the financial system that have been a burden to the outcomes that they've been trying to achieve on their own. Because we also participated with um, prosperity now in the debt addressing, uh, uh, addressing debt in black communities. This has been phenomenal. And so we are continuing to work with them as we look for prospective uh, um, uh, individuals in the banking and financial industry that will work with our, um, our family so that they can move ahead because as was stated, the challenges for uh, communities of color, and, and this is, is the thing in terms of working on the ground with families, listening and building relationships and talking with them, uh, we know what some of their challenges are. So when, um, in listening to the home ownership piece, um, and as we move this program forward, we have talked in the last 30 days, my team and I, because what we want to happen is something that Sally was hitting on. I don't know if she saw me shaking my head feverishly when she was speaking. It's be to now go into our affordable housing and say, who wants to go to home ownership? Because many of these families want to go to home ownership. What we learned when we had a home ownership program some eight years ago was that families who participated, it was a year long program. But what came out of that program was the, were, were, when the crisis hit, there was a study that showed that those families who participated in long-term home ownership program, 
uh, were able to sustain and weather that financial crisis better than those who just went to one day home ownership workshops. You develop a relationship, um, families get a clearer understanding of the responsibility as a homeowner versus when you go to the workshop. And while families may be um, financially ready, uh, unfortunately for many of the African Americans who participate, there are still many questions that they have and out of fear, even when they're having a crisis, they do not divulge what is going on. Through our work here, um, through our eviction program, because um, for a long time, um, many families wouldn't come because they recognized that coming to um, an eviction program at Bon Secours Community Works meant that they had to engage in a financial uh, capability uh, program. However, I can uh, share with you that 100% of families, when they finished with that um, uh, workshop, were um, amazed, thrilled, and, and actually wanted more. They would scream prior to wanting to having to take this as part of their way to receive assistance, but in the end, it was information that truly educate them. And to move back to the home, uh, the home buying workshop that we did some years ago, while everyone who goes to a home buying workshop uh, does not come out and decide to be a home a homeowner, the one thing that was said to us for those who didn't buy that they had a new understanding of their financial situation that even as a renter they were now in a better position than they were prior to starting so uh here what we try to do is empower and engage um of families so that there is long-term sustainability uh with the family because we understand that um without that um many of these families are afraid to move forward however as the um a lot of it has been put on nonprofits to help move uh, the needle on home ownership with families of, of color. Uh, the concern is that um, if you heard that 242 years before a family would um, uh, reach zero wealth, before they'd even grow wealth, it's a very long time. So as, as stated before, we're going to need more than just nonprofits doing the work that they do but we're also going to need families. Uh, we're also going to need legislation yeah, that also, is going to help us. Althea, I'm going to cut you off because I agree with you. We're going to need multiple solutions. And I think that um, that's one of the things that I'd like to just tie together with our presenters. It, it's not, uh, you know, I, I think just generally our culture is about single causality mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, one, you know, one solution will, you know, fix everything. Um, we're going to need multiple solutions to, to what's going on in our market in, in Baltimore. Um, so with that, I'm, I'm wondering, um, at, first of all, thank you to all the presenters. I, just, I really appreciate your time. And I, I know we're not going to, in uh, you know, roughly 15 minutes, we're not going to get through all of the questions. Um, but I do want to ask one question, which is, are there examples of increasing home ownership rates and also sites of displacement of renter households or, you know, decreases in vac vacancy? You know, basically, I, I don't know if there are any examples and maybe uh, folk, you folks can comment on your data. So just to make sure I understand the question, are there examples of increasing home ownership and rental displacement? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, it, yes. Um, well, I guess I'd say, first of all, the, the places where home ownership in, is increasing, very small number um, of, of places. We did not measure that statistic that you're um, asking for. What I think of, uh, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Alan, because I think what he was showing was where there are, um, where gentrification is occurring, um, it appears to be having a bigger impact thus far on low income whites than on black families. Again. Uh, yeah, I, I, I also just wanna highly recommend, I did post it in the chat, but the work that Prosperity Now has done, um, I also, I really applaud that work and the work that Bon Secure in terms of engagement is also 
leading the conversation with African Americans leading that conversation about home ownership. Um, and I think that's, it, it's just, it's great. I, I mean, particularly around the financial and debt, um, I think that, that they're also looking at models which empower. Um, so I think that's, that's a really key, uh, important part of uh, the work that Althea has been doing. So I just want to recognize that. Go ahead, Alan. Yeah, I just wanted to mention, I didn't look at that specific point, but I think it's probably a good bet that at least in a few of the gentrifying neighborhoods, especially when we're talking about relatively little new construction, but the extensive rehab of old row houses, that there is a shift from, you know, a, a lot of the units when they're rehabbed actually go from the rental stock into the owner-occupied stock. And so I, I don't have any doubt that that's happening. Again, it's relatively few neighborhoods in the, in the city as a whole. There is an alternative model where um, we've seen Rebuild Metro do this in the Oliver and now Johnson, they're working in the Johnson Square neighborhoods where they're taking um, a lot of vacant properties and rehabbing them and so, and increasing home ownership, um, but in a, in a, kind of a gradual way, working with renters to help them become homeowners. So I think when you have a lot of vacancy, there is that potential to increase home ownership without increasing any, any uh, without pushing out any renters. Absolutely. And I think that's what's happening in a number of the kind of intermediate neighborhoods in Baltimore. And again, Oliver is a good example of that, where there's a large inventory of vacant properties, some of which were rehabbed for home ownership, but others were rehabbed for rental occupancy. So actually the total inventory increased. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my, my concern is, is whether or not um, rental property um, will, will certainly um, not be affordable to many African Americans. Um, oh. We see that here in Southwest. Um, you know, they, they, they built um, a new high rise and based on the rent there there's nobody you know you, you really have to make a significant amount of money to to afford that and and even the concern of the property rental properties we have um because we're now you know conversation prior to to the coronavirus is different than now because um where we would have had some vacancies the people aren't moving because they don't have a job <laughs> and so moving becomes um a, a, a problematic um, if you have no employment, because chances are there's no way you can move into with no employment. Well, I think one thing that that highlights is the fact that there's there, and this again goes back to the, the need for a national solution. Mm -hmm. There's what I call a systemic imbalance between the earnings of very low income people mm -hmm. and what it costs to provide a decent rental unit. That's right. I mean, you know, if, if it costs, seven, say, seven or $800 a month for the most philanthropic landlord to provide a minimally decent unit, somebody, families earning 12000 10000 a year can't afford that unit. Right. So what we need, and I'm glad that at least some people and organizations are really focusing on that, we need to take the voucher program or something like that from being a lottery where a few lucky people get it, but most don't, to becoming an entitlement where any low income household that needs it can get assistance so they don't find themselves paying 60 or 70% of their income for rent. And then of course, as often as not being evicted. Um, and, and I, I just, um, I'm, I'm gonna dive in for a quick second here. I just wanna I, ask Tim in particular, what what you see uh, Baltimore compare, I a similar question to what I asked early, Alan earlier, how you see Baltimore different or the same as the other jurisdictions that you have been focused on? Well, by and large, um, Baltimore is a lot more like uh, cities like Memphis or Cleveland or Cincinnati that have faced like long-term issues of, of inequality in terms of evictions. And um, I think that, you know, there's, there was some chatter on the, on the chat about like CLTs, uh, which is a community land trust, uh, potentially like helping out with some of these issues. And 
Um, I think there are efforts to that, but something that's very fascinating about Baltimore is the high rate of vacancy and uh, prospecting that I've seen. Again, I'm not from Baltimore and I visited because I didn't want to just be like an outsider doing research on Baltimore and stuff like that. But I think that there, you know, there's some concerning market trends that tend to happen that uh, concern me quite a bit. And one thing that I think is unique to Baltimore that I don't really see in a lot of areas is that concept of prospecting. In other words, places that are townhomes, that are stayed vacant, that are bought very cheaply, they basically, people sit on them for a long time to wait until they're actually, um, you know, uh, able to turn around. Now, just real quickly to kind of tag along a little bit on, on the conversation that was kind of starting to be had, I think, uh, previously. Okay was, uh, you know, what's going to happen after COVID when the moratorium on evictions happen? And what's going to happen with, you know, I've been asked that question a lot. And I have a theory, and I'm just going to say my theory, and I hope it doesn't happen. But basically, I think that, you know, there's been a lot of months of people, Baltimore in particular is very eviction, like, heavy. I haven't seen a city yes. like that. And I think what might happen is that if there's any kind of moratorium, uh, or even some kind of grace, that grace or moratorium will be lifted around September when most of the moratoriums get lifted. And you might, you're gonna see a spike in evictions. But the problem with that is that migration in general across the United States is weird right now. It's different. Nobody's moving, mm -hmm. nobody's buying new apartments. The market has changed quite a bit. So you're gonna see a spike in evictions, but these landlords are not gonna be able to find people to replace those I agree. tenants. And what then happens is that you create a massive amount of homelessness. A lot of mom and pop landlords might just have to exit the business because they can't fill in the, the, the location because there's not a lot of, of uh, uh, demand for certain areas. One of my students just moved uh, here and he actually was able to negotiate a San Francisco apartment and he got the price dropped several hundred dollars because that, that apartment had been on the market for months. San Francisco to me is kind of the canary in the coal mine, especially evictions are the canary in the coal mine when it comes to like pre-gentrification kind of statuses. And I think that, you know, I'm, I'm afraid to see that high level of eviction, massive vacancy increases. And I think it will eventually, I hope that it decreases the market, but that is something that I think is also another component that's difficult to deal with is the market just got inflated so much, especially since 2011. You know, we lost $800 units, uh, you know, units that were affordable at inflation. So there's market issues, there's this COVID impact that's gonna happen. And, you know, I, I hope that it's not what I am theorizing that will happen. Sally, do you, you wanted to say something earlier? Um, that was to a, a previous point, um, but um, I think Tim is right. We're going to face this kind of crisis point probably before long. We do have, um, City of Baltimore does have a program that's helping five, 6,000 people um, who, with rent support, um, state of Maryland's coming out. But, you know, what we need is the, what was in the federal heroes bill, which never got past the Senate, which is 175 billion in housing support for the country. I mean, these numbers have to be big to prevent the scale of crisis that we're facing. Yeah, uh, Althea? Yeah, the, well, the challenge with some of that, and because we have housing, is that quite as is kept, some of these folks live in housing that's already been subsidized even in the building of it. Does, that doesn't allow the tenant to get any help believe it or not. And so at, at a time when the tenant hasn't created the situation they're in, they can't get help because of the kind of housing that was built. And so that's going to leave many, but you know, I'm, I'm with you. I, I think landlords ought to be careful before they go evicting everybody. <laughs> I'm not sure they're going to get what they're hoping for. Yeah. Alan? I, you know, I agree to this, the whole thrust of the conversation, and I think it's important to make that point. I don't know, you know, I don't know if landlords are going to evict as a reflex action or whether they're going to stop and think, 
And I think certainly something that the city or other groups could do is try to get the word out to them that eviction is not necessarily the best solution in this situation. Mm -hmm. Because I am, you know, I'm concerned about the tenants, but, you know, an awful lot of the people who, you know, most low-income tenants in Baltimore who don't live in subsidized housing projects live in one-family row houses. Mm -hmm. And most of those are operated by mom and pops. They're not, oper you know, the business about the hedge funds and Wall Street buying up, that's not what's going on here. These are mom and pops. A lot of them are just one or two notches above their tenants economically. They're not getting obscenely wealthy off this stuff. And it wouldn't take much, you know, if, if the situation is the way we're talking about it, what we could easily see in some of these neighborhoods, especially the struggling neighborhoods, is another wave of abandonment on top of what we're already seeing. So if we don't get some help from the federal government on these issues, I think the risk of serious decline in Baltimore, particularly in Baltimore's communities of color and lower income communities is very, very high. If I, if I could add one thing, too, is that, you know, when we looked at evictions, there were 150,000 per year, but it only led to about 6,000 removals, which is still astronomical. But imagine that, let's say that rate of filings of 150,000 stays the same through this COVID crisis. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Imagine how many physical removals we'll actually have now. We could likely have a 50% physical removal. So 75,000 households are physically removed. Right. And I, 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 I just want to reiterate Alan's point. I think he's, he's making a very important point that this is the whistle that we have to raise right now if we want to guarantee folks housing. Just say, hey, look, it's not hard to imagine what could very well happen. And something that's been interesting to me, too, is that in a city that's even a little bit uh, has a higher market rate in terms of renting, Landlord, mom and pop landlords are disappearing because fewer people can actually buy property to kind of like continue. It's kind of like a mortality rate yes. or lack of replacement rate of mom and pops. And those are the people that, you know, tend to have the lower rent areas. And so there's some argument to protect, to try and keep yes, them. Now there's some, some of that. Yes. Right, yes. right. But yes. there's a lot of nefarious activity that needs to happen. Right. But I think I just want to reiterate Alan's point and, and Sally's point too, just about... Yeah. I just add there that I think cities, and hardly any city in the United States does this, cities have a compelling interest in nurturing and encouraging mm -hmm. responsible small landlords. Absolutely, yes. And they, there's not much going on in that area. We've had, we've had discussions about it. At, yeah, that, that's uh, through our Small Developers Collaborative here in Baltimore. We've had a lot of discussions just about the needs of small developers and, and small landlords and it's a really important part of the market here. So yes, absolutely. That's a, it's a great point. Mm -hmm. Sally, did you want to say anything? Um, no, I just saw the question, how do we get the word out to mom and pop landlords? And um, there are, you know, there is some advocacy really getting rolling as a result of the COVID um, on the renter side, the Baltimore Renters United um, is very engaged. And then um, uh, CDN and others are, um, you know, really thinking about that communications piece. Um, how do we reach both both um, tenants and homeowners and landlords? We're all basically uh, at risk of insecurity right now and prevent the kind of some of the scenarios that we're talking about. So this is work that's got to, um, um, I think, you know, find, find support locally and, um, and start to roll out quickly. So I just, uh, I just want to wrap up. Uh, I think it's 429, so we've got one minute. Um, but I just want to wrap up and thank you all uh, for your time. Thank uh, Binia and your outstanding staff for putting this together and making it work. Um, I really appreciate everybody's t uh, time and talent and data. Um, and we also, I mean, we will post all the links to all the reports that we discussed today. Um, and that will be on Benia website as well as the recording of this. So if you missed any of it, um, you can go back and listen again. Um, and we're happy to make any connections and follow up with folks if there's, there's other things that we can do to help you in your work um, because this data is really powerful. And I just really appreciate the, the time that went into creating the, the reports. It's, it's really valuable and can be used uh, for a lot of the neighborhood work that is being done. 
as well as uh, policymakers. So thank you, and thank you, Seema. Moderating and to all of our panelists, that was amazing. Uh, this was uh, a session number six for Baltimore Data Week. Session number seven starts in 20 minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> your coffee and grab your dinner and meet us back here at five o'clock if you want to okay. learn about small business and lending in our neighborhoods, which is okay. thank you all so much. Uh, an incredible panel. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.